Hi everybody, welcome to Cascadia Clip installation training video series. My name is Michael Bousfield, the technical director at Cascadia Windows and Doors. Thank you for joining us. This is a quick introduction to try to address the why behind paying attention to cladding supports in exterior insulated walls. And then the subsequent uh, videos will be the more hands-on and tips and tricks components of the video series. So when we're talking about exterior insulated cladding assemblies, regardless of the cladding type, uh, a great deal of attention is being paid now compared to ever before on addressing thermal bridging within the insulation layer of these assemblies. Why is that and why is it important? Uh, so before we can define uh, why it is and exactly what we're talking about, I need to set the stage related to how heat is moving and how we are trying to control it. So heat and unwanted heat movement uh, is occurring in one of three separate ways. Radiation, where heat moves from a warm thing to a cold thing, uh, doesn't touch anything in between. Uh, the second one is conduction. So conduction occurs uh, either in solid objects or uh, when solid objects are in contact with each other. This is just heat moving from hot to cold to a solid. Convection as well is when heat is being moved by moving air or more scientifically a moving fluid. We're going to pick on the second one, conduction, throughout the rest of these few minutes. In construction, conduction, the heat, heat flow through solid objects, is based on those solid objects conductivity and you can see a whole bunch of examples of building materials conductivity here you'll notice that metals generally speaking are highly conductive compared to most other solid materials uh, and are, are at the relatively high end of the range and insulation materials the opposite the very lowest end of the con conductivity range and then non-metal components like composites and wood and fiberglass and plastic and rubber all of these types of materials they're in the middle but they're closer to insulation materials really than they are are to metal okay so now that we've set the stage with just a bit of physics to support this, why are we being forced to pay attention to this stuff? Well, it's for our own good eventually to build a more energy conserving built environment. But what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis in our industry is that regulations and energy codes are being put in place and ratcheted up to more stringent levels all over North America and they have been for more than a decade. The earliest examples had uh, either a reference to the ASHRAE 90.1 energy standard or a different energy standard that for most locations was kind of a copy and paste of the same physics at least. And in this standard, there were prescriptive paths that told the des designers what level of performance each type of a assembly would need to hit for a certain building type to be compliant. And there was also other compliance paths that allowed more math and modeling to occur. Now though, uh, even though those energy codes were important, they, on, and I'll show on the left graphic here, had the limitations of while they did have a target for the walls and a separate target for the roofs and a separate target for the windows, they lacked the level of detail necessary to address the performance of how those assemblies came together and if there was a lot of thermal bridging or not very much. Um, and they didn't really have a total outcome uh, target for the whole building as well. It was kind of just get the ingredients right and you'll end up with the, the dessert you want. And experience showed that that wasn't always turning out to be the case. The most modern energy codes that are being transitioned to right now and in the last couple of years and the next couple of years are more based on a total building amount of energy that is allotted for one year and it's based on the building's floor area, but it's a limit for the whole year. It's like having a bucket of energy that you can draw from for all purposes in the building for one year, but you don't get more. Well, a building designer's response to this is, okay, let's make the building enclosure high performance and lose the least amount of that finite amount of energy we can and if we can achieve that there's all this other left energy left over for more fun things in the building itself a new tv a business to operate whatever um, so that focus on getting the building enclosure performing correctly focuses us not only on the assemblies themselves but even a detailed level of how they interact 
And so when we start looking at cladding assemblies and exterior insulated layers within cladding assemblies, we start looking at the details. And the details that are important are primarily what non-insulation things exist within the insulation layer of that wall. So whether it's a stud or whether it's a girt or whether it's a bracket, all those things, they're not insulation, they're gonna cause an increased amount of heat loss through them because they have higher conductivity. Maybe they're metal, maybe they're not, but at least they're not insulation. And no matter what they're made out of, if they cause heat to flow faster than insulation, they contribute to thermal bridging. And our objective is to minimize it. If you look at the most basic example, if you look at a single continuous metal Z-girt on this graphic on the left-hand side here, it is a significant path of heat loss through an insulation layer. If that component within that layer is changed to a composite material, like a plastic or a fiberglass or any of these low conductivity materials, within that layer, it significantly uh, reduces the rate of the unwanted heat loss through the insulation. And these components are usually even intermittent. Now, a lot of uh, keen people that'll look, uh, look at this video and this graphic will say, well, is, is that not a combustible component in a non-combustible wall? And, Yes, you're right. Don't worry, that's taken care of. In fact, the physics and testing is explained in another video in this series. So if you're interested, once you finish this, skip to there. To sum up, it's for getting our wall assemblies to not only be higher performance, but literally to enable code compliance, whereas past designs no longer will, it's not the type of cladding or the type of insulation or the quantity of insulation that really makes the difference at a, at a mathematical or physics level. It's the stuff that's not insulation but is in the same layer. Take this example. On the left, 12 inches of insulation within a single metal girt is compared to the assembly on the right where there's a fiberglass intermittent spacer within only three and a half inches of insulation instead of 12 that three and a half inch in inches of insulation drastically outperforms the 12 inch example while being cheaper and thinner. But those, those two other advantages aside, it's substantially higher performing because it gets that metal out of that insulation layer. So I hope that explains some basic physics as to why this matters and why it's not going away. Uh, for more information on the tips and tricks of how to work with a Cascadia clip and make the installation even more efficient, uh, please have a look at the rest of the videos in this series. Thank you for joining us.